Yeah, so uh, my name is Les Allen. Um, I studied um, philosophy academically in the from the late 1970s through the 1980s. My particular interests were in ethics and epistemology, especially philosophy of science, and in metaphysics, where free will is one of those big questions in metaphysics. Um, currently, I run, I set up and run the Rational Realm website, where there's a number of my papers and papers from other people. And I also sit on the board of Humanist Australia, and I also started up Australia's first ex-religious support network. Uh, so why am I interested in the free will question? Um, because I think it has deep implications for the way we view other people, our relationships with other people, and also in terms of uh, moral responsibility. So there's a lot of argument about if determinism is true, what does that, that mean for whether it's ever right to blame and praise people? So these are real practical questions and there's practical implications then of course for the legal sphere as well. Do you want to outline some of the definitions that are relevant to this topic? Or like for instance, let's start with what is free will and what is freedom? Ah, well, that's the $64 million question, um, isn't it? Because the, um, the people who are what are called indeterminists um, think that free will is our capacity to do things differently, um, choose things differently that are not governed by our genetics and our environment and our prior experience. So there's a non-causal or a-causal element to our decisions. So that's one way of looking at free will. And they're the hard, the group called the hard determinists. They agree with the indeterminists, the libertarians, that's the other name for the indeterminists, the libertarians. Uh, they both agree together that free will has this central notion that we can act outside of our genetics and our prior conditioning and our environment. There's another contrasting view, definition of free will, uh, put by what are called the compatibilists. And they say that free will is completely compatible with the fact of determinism, if it is a fact. And free will is about to do, is to do with agency, our capacity to uh, think through reasons for action, understand the reasons for acting, uh, choosing different things, and to be able to give reasons uh, for why uh, we choose one thing or another. The, the other central aspect is about character, that when we act freely, we're acting in concert with our character, meaning our higher order desires. So there's two, that, there are two they're two, that's two dominant streams among the compatibilists, those who emphasise what's called reasons responsiveness, f people who act freely respond to reasons, and the other uh, uh, stream, which is um, an identity concep conception or a character conception of free will. We act freely we, when we act in accordance with our identity or our character. Okay, another definition. What is meant by determinism? What, what is meant by determinism and also randomness? Right. And indeterminism? Uh, randomness is a really difficult one. I think philosophers by and large agree on what determinism means. And what that means is that if you take the laws of physics, maybe as imperfectly as we understand them, and you take what are called the initial conditions or the system conditions, the prior, the state of the universe at a particular point in time. Take both those, laws of physics, current state of the universe, you can logically deduce all the future happenings of the universe. So what does that mean in practice? That if we knew perfectly the laws of physics and if we knew um, the state of the universe from five minutes ago, where I was positioned, the forces acting on me, what's happening in my environment, what's happening in my brain. If we knew all of those initial conditions, we literally, and, and we had a perfect computing machine, um, a very powerful one, we'd be able to predict what I was going to do 
in another five minutes. So philosophers had generally agreed on that definition of determinism. And what about indeterminism? So indeterminism is uh, simply the denial of the determinist thesis. So it's the denial that if we know the laws of physics and if we know uh, the initial conditions, we won't be able to deduce a future state of the universe. That somehow the future state of the universe is still uh, undetermined or underdetermined. So it's the denial of the determinist thesis. Okay, how does a lack of restriction view on free will rather than the contra-causality align or diverge with the traditional philosophical views on it, especially in the context of determinism? Um, well, I don't know whether there was one traditional view of free will. There's always... I mean, compatibilism really got going, started to be more precisely formulated during the Enlightenment, uh, for example, with um, uh, David Hume. And that was the... Uh, the no coercion view. I'm acting freely. If I, if, if I had chosen differently, I would have done differently. Um, that's been very much refined. Uh, but it, I think even in the Middle Ages, I mean, the Middle Ages, it was a different kind of argument because there the argument was not about um, the laws of the universe and the initial conditions determining all future states. It was about God's omniscience. That was the big debates in the Middle Ages. Um, but even Aristotle, it even goes back to Aristotle with his discussion of voluntary acts. Uh, and that's generally regarded as a compatibilist view. So the view of compatibilism goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Um, and the, ter the, the, like the hard deterministic view, we can see that from that point in time all the way through the modern period. So I don't think there's any traditional view. There are traditional views. It's always been a big competition, a big battleground, and still is. In your essay on free will and compatibilism, you discuss the relationship between determinism and free will. Can you further elaborate on your stance on this? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, in my essay, I enunciate what I call the 4C theory of free will. And that is, I enunciate what I think are four conditions that have to be met to say that an agent act, acted freely. And the first one is that the, uh, I call compulsion, that's the first C, that the person doesn't feel, psychologically feel compelled. The second one is about control that the agent is not controlled by a third party, like they've got um, a brain implant or they've been brainwashed. The third condition I call character, and that is that the action, the free action, is in concert with, uh, with their character. It's not out of character. And the last one is I call cognition, and that is that the uh, person is cognitively competent. So those last two go to what I was describing before. So this last one about cognitive competency, that ties into what I was talking about, reasons responsiveness. Uh, we say a person is cognitively competent when in, at the least, they can understand reasons and give reasons for action and being able to think about the different choices they have. That third one that I said, character, um, I mentioned before about the identity or character view of free will by compatibilists, that an act is free if it's in concert with a person's character or identity, meaning that it's in concert with their higher level desires is one way to look at it. So that's my 4C theory uh, of, of free action, the four conditions that need to be met. Excellent. Given Darwin's theory of evolution, do you think there was a point um, at which free will became real that wasn't where it wasn't there beforehand? Uh, and a related question is, do you think certain animals are cognitively competent enough to qualify for free will? Yeah, that's a really big question. I think the point, the transition point 
is where in the evolutionary lineage, species weren't just responding to the environment in a stimulus response, automatic stimulus response um, way of acting. So meaning that their responses weren't completely instinctual. So what does that mean? It means that free will became a capacity of creatures when they were able to a model the environment, consider different possibilities for action, reason about the different possibilities and put some cognitive processing towards which is the best um, action for them out of the possibilities to actually um, do. So it's that point where we could cognitively recognise different possibilities and reason through them. Now, where that happened, that's a really big question, like the higher hominids, like apes. Um, yeah, look, I haven't got a settled view on, say, apes, chimpanzees. Um, I haven't got a settled view on that because they do, even my dog goes through some cognitive processing. You know, when he's, they've got to choose between, am I gonna choose between the breakfast that's just been put out um, or am I gonna choose Les's calling us to go for a walk and you can see them, the cogs turning in their brain. So even dogs have some cognitive level of processing where they're evaluating the different futures that they could bring about, the different choices that are open to them. That's a really difficult question. If all the functional requirements for free will based on the four C's that you just elaborated on were ticked off in an artificial intelligence, would you say then the artificial intelligence would have free will? Or is there some another layer to it? Yeah, so, um, so for the 4C theory to apply to an artificial intelligence, that first requirement uh, is probably the most apt one. The artificial intelligence has to um, have a subjective life, know what it's like to feel, um, and when they act freely, the condition is that they don't feel compelled by the circumstances. They don't feel like they're coerced is one example. So they've got to have a subjective being about them. Now, when that happens, when is that going to happen? In the development of AI, you know, that's anybody's guess. But when we get to that point, and when we get to that point, so I'd say most certainly they're already at the point where the other three um, criteria apply, that they'll have a character, an identity, they'll have higher order desires and lower order desires, um, and um, that they can cognitively work through the futures that are open to them and have some cognitive processing there about which is the best choice for them to make. But the really critical one to get to that point is the artificial intelligence has to know what it's like to be me, what it feels like to be me in that phenomenal sense. And as I said, when that happens is anybody guess, anybody's guess. And then being able to determine us as outside observers when an AI gets to that point because it's internal to them and we can't look into their minds just as I can't look in or we can't look into other people's minds. Um, that's the other epistemologically difficult question when, so, you know, an artificial intelligence can become conscious, have a lived experience, but then how do we tell when, when they are at that point? How do we interpret the interpretability problem of not only whether, what an AI will do, whether it's going to obey or disobey or, or you know, act in the interests of humans and other sentients or not. It's also whether it's conscious. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a hard one, yeah. Um, so you argue that deterministic compatibilism underpins our notion of moral responsibility. How does this view reconcile with the common intuition that moral responsibility requires some form of genuine choice? Mm. So a compatibilist argues that even if determinism is true, we do have genuine choice. We are real agents working in, um, living in the world. 
where we genuinely have alternate possibilities open to us and we can cognizize those and deliberate about which one we're going to take. So we have true genuine agency, we make true genuine choices. Um, the second part of your question was on... Well, how do, how do our view, how does this view reconcile with the intuitions around moral responsibility? So if we're a compatibilist, we have genuine agency, we make genuine choices. So in moral philosophy, it's still generally agreed that for someone to be morally responsible, they could have done otherwise. And there's a lot of argument about how do we interpret could have done otherwise. So for a compatibilist like me, I think there is a very real sense of, even though determinism is true, we could have done otherwise. Now, if that's the case, if we're right about that, um, then that leaves it completely consistent with our moral intuitions that to be morally responsible, we need to have been able to have done otherwise. And we think that condition is satisfied, that we really could have done otherwise. And that goes to some technical argumentation about, well, what are the different senses of could have done otherwise and in what sense is it used when we talk about John when he robbed the bank that he could have done otherwise. And as compatibilists we think there is a very real and genuine sense that John could have not robbed the bank even though he did do that. And I do argue in my paper that to my mind determinism is necessary for moral responsibility. Not only that there seems to be a disconnect between moral responsibility and determinism, I think the two go hand in hand. You can't have moral responsibility if there are these indeterminist forces working in our brains that whether I choose to rob the, the bank or not is literally down to chance. It's not up to me. How can we be morally responsible on this indeterminist system where things just happen and they're not linked to our character and our genes? That just doesn't make sense to me. Well, this feeds into the legal questions, doesn't it? So you touch on um, the implications in your theory of the legal contexts. Could you further elaborate on your compatibilist perspective on free will and how that could inform legal practices, especially in areas like criminal uh, responsibility and crime mitigation? Yeah, so I think the legal system, certainly in the liberal democratic countries that are, have got a, a secular, so there's a reasonably strict separation between church and state, in those legal systems, I'm talking about UK, United States, Australia, um, some of the, the countries in Europe, France, Germany, um, closer to us, New Zealand, all of these legal systems are what I regard as, regard as compatibilist. That when a criminal, a uh, supposed criminal is brought, the accused is brought to trial, there's never, never any expert brought in to say the accused is criminally liable because what's happening in their brain is when they made the decision, there was a causal or um, not fully deterministic processes going on. They don't call in the metaphysicians, they don't call in the neuroscientists to show that when John robbed the bank, he was criminally liable because somehow what was happening with his neurons firing in his motor cortex to, for example, pull the trigger on the gun or uh, threaten the bank staff, that, that those neurons firing were somehow disconnected from his genetics and his previous upbringing. That never happens in criminal trials. What does happen in criminal trials, um, that the notion of free will is really central in criminal trials to showing that a person is criminally liable. If it's shown that they did not act freely, then um, there's either mitigating circumstances or it's exculpatory, meaning the, the case is thrown out of court altogether. So what sorts of things for a judge and, a, and a, a jury count for someone acting not freely? Well, they're the things I talk about in my essay. They were under the influence of drugs. 
uh, they were brainwashed. Um, they were coerced. Uh, someone held a gun to them and forced them to do something they didn't really want to do. Um, so these are the kinds of considerations, coercion, manipulation that judges and juries look at to determine whether someone acted freely and then whether it it's, um, makes sense to ask the question whether they're criminally reliable, uh, criminally liable. So as I'm saying here, um, our legal systems are compatibilist. Okay, right. Let's uh, just say we did, let's just say in the future that we did have the technology to sort of replay a movie. It was going inside somebody's brain, you know, atom for atom, process for process, um, you know, energy flow and all that sort of stuff. Do you think that would be useful? Um, uh, well, it's already currently useful at the macro level. So uh, the defence lawyers argue for mitigating circumstances in some, uh, for some supposed criminal acts. So um, a defence lawyer will bring in experts on drug addiction to show that the person was under the influence of drug addiction. And the experts will show how people under addiction, and I talk about this in my essay, people uh, under addiction, it changes their, um, their decision part of the, the brain. So that part of the brain where they think through and reason about alternative courses of action is literally short-circuited when somebody is under the influence of drugs. The other case is with uh, certain mental illnesses, um, like for example, um, brain tumours. Well, this is not a this is a, um, a biological malfunction, which is a different kind. But people who have a um, a tumour in their brain can affect their personality and they can become violent. So in some cases, um, a defence lawyer is called in to show that a person had a brain tumour that was once again impacting their decision parts of their brain and short-circuiting it. So we already do that in criminal trials. Now that could, well, we're thinking it, that will become further refined as the technological tools get further developed and we can show much more precisely at the neuronal level or the modular level in the brain how this short-circuiting works. We already have a, a reasonable, reasonably good idea, but uh, more information there will tidy up some of the more difficult legal cases. All right, let's just branch off a little bit into the idea of moral enhancement and the few varieties of this. One is the biomedical moral enhancement where people who um, are alive uh, can have a pill and it would somehow um, increase their empathy or increase their ability to reason through difficult ethical quandaries, but it would also probably bind them towards a doing the more ethical thing, which was the best for everybody, would, would result in the best outcome for everybody. So yes, if there was a means of moral enhancements, would it increase freedom or decrease freedom or increase free will or decrease free will? Yeah, um, interesting question. Uh, one thought I have is if the person freely chose to take the bill, pill or get the medical procedure done so they were fully cognizant of what they were doing, wanting to be a moral person, doing the things necessary to get to that point. It's like giving up smoking. You know, you make a conscious decision to go to behavioural therapy to give up smoking, knowing that it's going to change your character. Um, if that's the case, in those cases, it doesn't rob the person of their free will. Um, if, if we do, for example, genetic manipulation before a child is born, I'm thinking that it does rob them, the baby, the later adult, of their free will because then it comes under my criterion of control, being controlled by a third party. And this seems to be a clear-cut case where to make the person moral, you are this other third party, the doctor, the lawmakers, um, are intervening um, to change that person's, that baby's makeup. So I'm thinking if the person doesn't make a conscious decision to have that done to them, then it's really robbing them uh, to some extent or a large extent of their free will. 
A lot of it might come down to genetic lottery as well, um, whether their, their, their capacity to reason through different choices or their, their boundedness to doing things in the interests of the many, right? So in a sense, if, if we were to stumble upon an alien civilization that was very extremely moral and never, never really did anything that was out of the interests of the population, even though their heritage millions of years ago were individual agents operating from selfish means, selfish motives, do you think they would have more freedom or less freedom? So how did they get from their prior state generations ago of acting selfishly, how did they get from there to them always acting morally? What happened in the intervening period? How did they get there? Well, I mean, I don't know. Okay, so let's just assume... Oh, this okay. is an important part. Yeah. Of let's just say that um, they got there through genetic manipulation yeah. and cybernet... They, they, they uh, merged with machines. So cybernetics merging with machines and genetic engineering yeah so once again if it's done by third parties not the agent themselves um, then i'd say to that extent it's robbing them of their free will now it might not rob them of all of their free will because this genetic manipulation might not influence whether they're going to choose coffee or tea in the morning for example or whether they're going to have children or not have children if that's not a moral choice so some some or a lot of aspects of their lives can still uh, operate under free will, but those parts that are the designed outcome of a genetic manipulation, then those aspects of their choices, they've been robbed of their free will. Yeah, it's interesting. Like it, it, um, extending an, a, an agent's capability of reason so that they can reason through very difficult trolley problems or, you know, whole tree structures of possibility, but also making, uh, I guess, reducing their will to act selfishly and their will to um, act in the interests of the many. That could be a form both, you know, increasing uh, free will, but also reducing free will, maybe. But then again, the civilization that was produced may have more freedoms in many different ways because of the less waste heat that is caused by individual actors fighting against each other to, to achieve their own selfish interests could outweigh the, the freedom gained from individual actors just working in self-interest. But have you got any comments about that? Yeah, you make a really important point there, Adam. So, for example, if in the previous generations there was a lot of murder and stealing and murder and stealing robs the victims of their free will and then if you engineer the society or the doctors and the lawyers and the parliamentarians engineer society so that people are less wanting to murder and steal then you're bringing about a new society, a new set of circumstances that enhances people's freedom because now they're not worried about being murdered or worried about having their stuff stolen and not having to worry about that and not having that done to them means that they've got a broader range of choices that they can do. So yeah, you make a really good point. So in some ways, um, freedom of choice has been taken away, uh, but in other ways, it's been enhanced. So. So the two don't, well, obviously the two merge together because it's the same agents and the same society, but they're two different variables we're looking at. The increase and the decrease in free will because you've got a greater range of options because you're not worried about being murdered and having stuff stolen, that's one variable. The other variable is that you, your actions are now constrained because of your designed genetics. Interesting. Uh, can, oh, can I say something about reason? Because you said, um, uh, what if uh, it's, we're able to engineer a greater capacity to reason? And I'm thinking that will enhance people's capacity for free will, because my, one of my criteria is cognitive competency, the ability to understand 
the various choices and reason through the reasons for and against doing the particular choices. So anything that enhances that cognitive processing, the capacity for cognitively processing the different options available, uh, is literally enhancing our capacity for free will. Do you think then, I mean, this sounds very similar to the way laws work. I mean, they reduce people's freedom to go out and just kill, murder, rape and pillage just for their own selfish interests. But at the same time, everybody who's part of the civilization that enacts these laws is less prone. They, they don't need to worry about protecting themselves or spending so much of their resources protecting themselves um, from this sort of thing happening. And, and, and then, therefore, they're afforded the freedom to be, be able to, with the resources that they have, focus on arts and, and uh, focus on, like, doing understanding history or you know pursuing personal interest so i guess it would be a very similar argument there Sounds yeah so uh, so the worldwide happiness survey showed consistently over the last 20 years that people's life satisfaction and perceived happiness increases when they feel they're in control of their lives that they can make the important decisions they can act autonomously to lead the lives they want to live so in countries that are wracked by, um, by civil war and by corruption, these are societies in which people's actions are severely constrained and they're less satisfied with their lives. So where we can engineer societies where people feel comfortable, stable, safe, uh, and they can do what they need to do to get at least a minimally a decent standard of living which then allows them to enrol at university or um, uh, uh, do painting or whatever, um, then uh, A, those people's sense of happiness and life satisfaction is improved because their agency has increased and we want to say that then they have, then have a greater capacity to exercise their free will. Can you uh, give us a rundown on the two different meanings of libertarian when it comes to political theory. Mm. Um, so when I've been using the term libertarian, this is in the context of the area in philosophy called metaphysics, where we're talking about free will. And that's a metaphysical notion of freedom. And the libertarians are those who say that our actions are not completely determined by prior system states and physical laws. That's one meaning of libertarian and libertarianism as a counter to determinism. The other meaning of libertarianism is as used not in metaphysics, but in political theory. And that meaning of libertarian is a libertarian is a person who goes for minimal government interference in labor laws, in the economy and so on. So there are two quite distinct meanings of libertarianism and we need to keep that in mind. Now, um, there could be some crossovers, but I mean, here's the thing. You could be a political libertarian in political theory, think that um, there ought to be minimal government interference in people's lives and yet be a metaphysical, uh, and yet be a determinist, I should say. You could be a political libertarian and yet be a determinist on the free will question. So there are intersections here, and I suppose this is why some people get confused. How do linguistic practices shape our understanding of the relevant philosophical problems here? And you, you mentioned that incompatibilists are injecting the ordinary language meaning of free will with their own metaphysical presuppositions. In what way are they doing that? Yeah, um, there's a... I think one important way is that the, especially the hard determinists I talk to and read, they, some are neuroscientists, some read a bit of neuroscience, some read about the development of science, especially since the Enlightenment, where the, the, the universe is rule governed or law governed. And they think maybe quite intuitively, 
okay, if everything is determined, determined, opposite of free. And they then automatically go on to the next step. If determinism is true and neuroscience is showing us that, um, then we must have no free will. But that's quite a shallow way of thinking. The question about freedom and determinism is much more complicated than that. They're going by their intuitions after they've read a little bit of science and neuroscience. The reason why I say it's more complicated than that is because the way we use free, free will language, like a typical case, um, did John Mar marry Mary of her own free will? When you think through what is meant by the person asking that question and think through similar paradigm cases of people acting freely and not acting freely, when you actually analyse and do a survey of free will talk, the way people use free will in ordinary discourse, um, and I give many examples in my paper, you come to realise that when someone asks, did John mar marry Mary of her own free will, that person is not asking whether there were contracausal or acausal happenings in their neurons, no. What they're looking for is when John married Mary, was he coerced by his family or was he held at gunpoint? They're looking for things that encumbered their ability to make their own decision, whether there were external coercive forces at play. That's what they're asking about. Not, they're not inquiring about metaphysics or neuronal happenings in the brain. Uh, and this is what many philosophers have done since, what, the 1940s with what's called ordinary language analysis. We say the philosophers and the theologians have to get out of their offices, their professorial offices, their theological offices, think, you know, coming up with their own intuited meanings of free will, they actually have to get out into the real world and analyse how people actually talk about free will in real life. And that goes in the legal system as well, because I find a lot of um, hard determinists especially have no, uh, not much um, recognition of how important the, t the term free will is in legal discourse and how it is tied to not whether there are acausal or contracausal happenings in the neuronal firings. It's about, like we were talking about before, whether the accused person was drug addicted, whether they were suffering some uh, uh, um, congenital condition, whether they had a gun held to this head, whether there were things in their external or their internal environment, like a tumour, that was restrict restricting their capacity to evaluate reasons and go on reasons, whether they were encumbering, that's the umbrella term that I like to use, whether there were factors that were encumbering their ability to choose. That's what free will talk is all about, not this metaphysical question that philosophers spend so much time arguing about. There, well, there used to be a popular Oxford School of Normal Language Philosophy that might have, the popularity may have waned, and the paradigm case argument. But it's still seemingly influencing a lot of philosophy of mind. How can insights from the Oxford School of Ordinary Language Philosophy and the paradigm case argument help here? Yeah, look, I think it's enormously useful because people like Austin, who were one, probably the main instigator of the Ordinary Language School of Philosophy in the 1940s, um, this has been very critical, I think, in advancing philosophy forward, uh, getting, out, getting out of solving technical problems that are of philosophers' own making. Uh, because the idea is to solve real-world problems. Are we morally responsible? Do we have genuine agency? And I think to answer those questions, we have to go and look at how um, those terms are used, how real people talk about those things in real life. It doesn't help us at all 
when we isolate ourselves as philosophers from the real world and come up with our own technical definitions that have no real um, alliance with the way people uh, talk about free will. And the same goes in moral philosophy as well. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit in ordinary language analysis in analysing terms like good and right and justice. And I think a lot of moral philosophy has gone off the rails as well in, once again, philosophers and theologians sitting in their ivory towers and not looking at how moral language, moral judgments actually happen in real life. Language has evolved over time. So there's, there seems to be the street talk, the general definitions that people use that are common and, and that's, that's what's you know, grounded in the everyday conversations that people have. But then again, to me, there seems to be a need and a trade-off to use better or more appropriate language to deal with difficult cases in order to make progress moral progress to be able to sort of have language that is more specific to different types of something like death or different types of love or different types of ethics. So yeah, so there is the use case of keeping it simple to be able to communicate the, the ethics and the philosophy to uh, in street talk and the need to refine the tools of language to be able to cope with more difficult um, questions and make more progress. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned um, different definitions of death, and I talk about um, how the meaning of dead has evolved in the last hundred years or so. Um, so and you were mentioning paradigm cases. So it will always be the case that however we, we, we refine our words, our free will language, our language about dead and alive, however we refine that with finer categories, um, one way of testing it is do we still preserve the paradigm cases? So uh, talking about death, so up until the modern era where we could keep people who were brain dead, um, keep them alive with artificial respiration and keeping the heart uh, beating. Um, up until that time, you're either dead or alive, but now with these uh, medical miracles where we can keep people alive, I think there's now three, at least three different states of death. There's brain death, there's cardiovascular death, and I think there's another one as well. So we further refined our categories of being dead and alive. But when we do that, we still have to preserve the paradigm cases. So however you refine it, you still want it to be the case that Obama, pres uh, who was President Obama, is still classed as alive and Genghis Khan is still classed as dead. So those paradigm cases, we need to preserve that. And we need to do that in cases of free will as well. So if we refine the term of free will, um, uh, we, st we still want it to be the case that the, the guy with the gun held to his head forced to rub a bank, paradigm case, we still want to be able to say that person did not act freely. And when I decide after some reasoning which school to send my child to, we still want that to come out as a free choice. Um, so and this is where the hard determinists go off the rails. They say, look, applying modern neuroscience and physics, we determine that there are no free actions. And I'm thinking, well, you've gone completely off the rails. Uh, you've now gone so far away from what we ordinarily mean by free will. You're not just finessing the term, um, bringing more nuanced senses of, of free will you're ditching it altogether, which now makes no sense of when I choose which school to send my child to, I'm acting freely. But when I rob a bank um, with a gun held to my head, I'm not acting freely. We still want to preserve that fundamental distinction. Now, like the term death has been refined uh, since uh, modern medical terminology, um, with neuroscience and what we've found about found out about drug addiction and um, abnormal 
conditions of the brain like brain tumour, we're finding more and more finding out more and more about how those maladies impact the decision making parts of our brain. So we can make further refinements about to what extent someone has acted freely. So to give you an example, in the Middle Ages, if you were mentally ill, um, people were still considered morally responsible. Um, and even in some states in America, mental illness might be a slight mitigating circumstance. But what we know now is that mental illness, as I was saying before, short circuits that cognitive parts of our brain where we can recognise different choices and reason through the benefits and disbenefits of taking particular actions. Um, so now, in legal cases, if someone has a brain tumour, we, uh, and it looks like that's altered their personality, which may be led to them committing violence on their life partner. We now bring in the neuroscientists to say, to show to what extent that brain tumour, using what we know from modern medical science, we can better determine what size tumour is required to more and more shut down those decision-making parts of the brain. So we can have finer gradations now to what extent someone acted freely. Same with schizophrenia, same with drug addiction. What level of drug addiction do we need to get to to say that that person didn't act freely at all or they lost somewhat their capacity to free will? We can now make those finer distinctions into what extent someone acted freely because this is a really important point. It's not the case that someone acts completely freely or someone acts completely unfreely. There's a whole spectrum where a person can be to what extent they acted freely. And now modern neuroscience, what we're le learning about drug addiction and mental illness is giving us those finer gradations where we can judge to what extent someone acted freely and not acted freely. Do you think that there's some sort of optimal Goldilocks zone or sort of Nash equilibrium where everybody is sort of compelled to act morally or ethically to achieve the optimum sort of Pareto optimum of like compulsion and freedom? Uh, do you think that there's a, like a, a, a point at which there's a perfect balance? Um, well, um, when you said to what extent should someone be compelled to act morally, if they're compelled, they're not making a moral choice. They're being forced to make that choice. Um, so th I think that's the important thing there. We can't compel someone to act morally because if we do, we're taking away their agency and they no longer become a moral agent who can make moral choices. Now there's, uh, um, you know, there's an important discussion about moral education because we want to educate our children to be upstanding citizens, to act empathetically. So we guide people's, our young children's moral development. But we want to do that to the extent that we're enhancing their agency and not brainwashing them. So take religious sects that brainwash people to act in particular ways and they think they're saying that those people are acting in accordance with God's wishes therefore they're acting morally but if you deprive person a person of sleep if you're constantly watching them uh, with watches 24 hours a day to report when they've done the right thing and done the wrong thing when you're constraining um, the information that they can get through television papers, uh, television and newspapers and, and, and social media. When you're applying all of these constraints to someone's behaviour to get them to act in accordance with God's wishes, then that's brainwashing, it's taking away their agency. So we want to develop children's moral character where we preserve their agency and not rob them of... So there's an important distinction between brainwashing and proper moral, develop, proper moral education of children.
Given advances in neuroscience and psychology that challenge traditional notions of free will, how does your compatibilist views accommodate these scientific perspectives, particularly the findings that suggest much of our decision making is unconscious? Okay, so there's two things there. One is, um, I want to push back on the notion that modern neuroscience is somehow countering the compatibilist viewpoint because I think people have been assuming compatibilism, ordinary language users have been assuming compatibilism all the way from ancient Greece. I mean, Aristotle argued for a compatibilist view all the way through the Middle Ages to the modern era. So I don't think there's a traditional view. There's been two dominant views about free will. One is the compatibilist perspective and the other one is the um, incompatibilist perspective taken by the indeterminists on the one hand and the hard determinists on the other. Now, the hard determinists and the incompatibilists are very much are in the minority um, among professional philosophers because the compatibilist view is held by around about 60% of professional philosophers, whereas hard determinism is still accepted by around about 10% of professional philosophers and around about um, a 10% um, uh, by incompatibilists, about 10% of professional philosophers are in, um, indeterminists, I should say. Um, so if you want to talk about a current traditional view, the current tradition, traditional view is compatibilism. So that's the first thing. The second thing is whatever happens in neuroscience and in, cover, uh, in uncovering the genetic determinants, the environmental determinants, the upbringing determinants of our behaviour. However that progresses is not going to impact on compatibilism at all because compatibilism is arguing that determinism is compatible with free will. But you bring up the important point. Um, modern psychology and neuroscience is showing that more and more that many of our behaviours which we think are uh, volitional um, a right that we do because of conscious reasoning, there are unconscious processes going on. And behaviour economics uh, is doing a lot in looking at that. Um, and um, uh, System 1 and System think 2 thinking by, I can't remember the philosopher's Kahneman. name. Daniel Kahneman. And Daniel. Daniel Kahneman is doing a lot of work in that area where much of our decision making is by the System 1 area of the brain, quick quick response because quick response is needed and is instinctual um, but then there's system two thinking where I'm deciding what car I'm going to buy, which school to send my child to, uh, which jobs I'm going to apply for. These um, engage the system two more labour intensive, time intensive, more uh, cognitive intensive uh, processing. Um, so the thing is, the more we find out about this more rapid system one unconscious thinking that we do do, when we find out about that, we, that gives us more agency because then we can recognise our biases. Ah, okay, when I decided X, I wasn't, there were unconscious biases there that were brought about by, you know, I might like blondes more than brunettes and that's why I was more prone to employ a blonde rather than a brunette. Once I become cognizant of those unconscious biases, I can then put in strategies to work around them so that I'm putting in more reasoning into my decisions and not relying on these instinctive responses. So the more we're finding out about these unconscious biasing processes, it actually gives us more agency and not less. It's actually allowing us to think, um, act, uh, um, use free will more rather than less. So in, in your talk on can we really be free willing robots, in your analysis you trace the etymology of the term free will to the 16th century and define it as an absence of constraint. How does this historical context influence contemporary philosophical debates about free will, particularly in relation to determinism and libertarianism? 
Yeah, good question. So this is part of the ordinary language analysis. If we understand how the first uses of the term free will um, occurred, then we know the origin of the term free will, what was driving it. And what we see from the earliest days, and I give examples in my paper, um, is that um, when we say that somebody acted freely, um, all the examples that I give, and there are many more examples, show that what the person meant was the agent acted unencumbered. They weren't being forced or coerced uh, into acting the way they did. They acted in an unencumbered way. So that's the fundamental idea behind A, a compatibilist analysis, uh, which I'm saying then aligns with the first uses of free will. But let me point out some, another bit of ordinary language analysis that I talk about in my paper. When you look at how the word free is attached to other words in the English language, it really reinforces the point. Say, take the word freehand, when somebody draws freehand. When we say, John drew the picture of the horse freehand, we don't mean that there were acausal or non-deterministic happenings in his motor cortex. We're saying that when he, we're saying when he drew freehand, we're saying he didn't use any instruments like set squares or circles to do the drawing. Take when we say when somebody um, uh, free speech, when we talk about free speech. We're not saying that when somebody um, spoke freely, uh, when they had free speech, we're not saying that the, um, the uh, motor cortex part of their brain that was moving their lips when they were doing speech, somehow those neurons were not fully determined by other happenings in the brain. No, we're talking, this is a political notion. We're saying when they spoke freely that there weren't any governmental controls on what they could say or, or not say. Um, free range, free range chickens. Again, we're saying when the free, a, a free range chicken, we're not saying that when the chicken is running around, somehow they're running um, and once again, their motor cortex, the happenings in their little chicken brain, there were indeterministic forces happening in their brain. No, we're saying free range means that there isn't a constrained fence constraining them to a small area. So here are other ways, other uses in the English language where we attach the word free that doesn't mean contracausal or indeterministic. It's the same with when we use the term free will. You, um so you're involved in a lot of the three fort and humanistic circles and some of the atheist events in Melbourne. How do you reconcile the concept of free will with atheistic or materialistic worldviews? Yeah, this is where I love talking to probably mostly skeptics and atheists who I'm thinking are not, are not card carrying humanists because let me say, um, within the humanist tradition, humanism um, has a lot to say about agency and people being free to live the best lives as they see fit. So a humanist perspective is wanting to give people agency and allowing people to act freely. But there are many atheists and skeptics who take on board a little bit of science, a little bit of neuroscience and think intuitively, ah, okay, if we act determin deterministically, ah, that's the opposite of acting freely. And that's where I love speaking to those audiences to try and divest them of the notion that taking a scientific view of the world doesn't automatically mean, ah, we have no free will or, ah, we have no agency. I've even s seen atheists argue that we don't even, it's not that we don't even make, um, genuine choices. We don't even make choices at all. That's how radical the view gets. And then moving on from that, they say, ah, uh, nobody can be responsible for their actions. And ah, we shouldn't be blaming people or praising people because they couldn't help what they did anyway. So I love talking to those audiences to help them think through that the question is much more nuanced than, than what they've originally given credit for. I've got a, a bit of a rhetorical question, and that is, it is often said by, you know, the, in the choirs of atheist circles that one can be good without God, 
but can we be good without free will compatibilism? Well, my, my answer is uh, no, because a requirement for being a moral agent is that you have the capacity to act freely. So ought implies can, which was one of the big dictums that came out, I think, um, from, from the Enlightenment. Uh, when moral philosophers really started thinking more deeply about these questions and applying modern analytical tools to this question. Ought implies can. So somebody can only say somebody ought to do something if they have the capacity, the capability to have done otherwise. Are there ethical dilemmas that are particularly challenging when viewed through the lens of compatibilism rather than just hard determinism or uh, libertarianism? Oh, good question. I, none, none come to mind. If you have one in mind, Adam, then... I don't. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I'm just trying to think, if, are there ethical dilemmas particularly challenging? Uh, well, I mean, let's just take a, a classical trolley problem. If the trolley, if, if, if it's just a computer that's going to decide how to save the most lives, um, to sort of optimise, you know, a really difficult tro tro trolley problem, then wouldn't a deterministic computer that could sort of... Uh, optimise the amount of lives saved, the amount of utility saved, be more moral than somebody who is perhaps encumbered by free will and having to weigh things up a bit? Uh, but I think the assumption there that the moral computing machine is a traditional or a classical utilitarian and that's not the case. That's a highly contentious issue. I mean, we're still arguing about well, the is. trolley problem, and there are different variants on the trolley problem. It's interesting, the different variants on the trolley problem. One important variant is where, to save the people on the track, the five people on the track that the trolley is going to run over, you have to push a fat man off the bridge. The interesting thing is, when people, most people who answer that question say, no, it's not right to push the fat man off the bridge, but it is right to pull a lever to divert the trolley. And that's because the, when they look at the FR, fMRI imaging, the, um, the, the fat man scenario activates the emotive parts of the brain, uh, whereas the pulling the lever um, scenario activates the more cognitive processing, rational processing part of the brain. So two parts of the brain are activated depending on whether the scenario is you're in direct relation to another human being or whether it's more distant uh, where you're pulling a lever and you're not interacting with another human being directly. Um, so the big question is, I mean, this is the big question that moral philosophers argue over. Should we be listening to the more emotive part of the brain or should we be listening to the more rational calculating part of the brain, which is the true moral centre? Moral philosophers are still arguing about that. So to get to the basic point here, um, it's not really a slam dunk about what a, a moral computer would do. Different moral philosophers would argue we've got to program the computer this way, just calculate utilities. Um, and another band of moral philosophers will say, no, you've got to program the computer that um, recognise, so the AI or the computing machine recognises that it's wrong to directly harm another human being. This is a doctrine of double effect. Um, is it? Now, how the doc certainly the doctrine of du double effect uh, is used by moral philosophers in both cases, pushing the fat man off the bridge and um, pulling the lever. And there's a lot of complex argument about different de uh, do doctrine of double effect proponents will argue differently about whether it's right to push the fat man off the bridge 
because there's argument about what are the intended consequences. So some doctrine of double effect proponents will say it's an intended consequence to kill the fat man because it's foreseeable. Whether, whereas other proponents will say no, it's an unintended consequence. So they, they're not even agreeing on that. So it's a, high, it's a very fraught question. Okay. What's the importance of praise and blame in a compatibilist theory of free will? Oh, um, so it, for most compatibilists, it plays a central notion and in two ways. One is, you know, I, I, I really take a, a dual approach to praise and blame as a compatibilist. In one way, we use praise and blame to modify other people's behaviour. And this is where uh, peer pressure uh, plays a part. So if somebody is freeloading in a team, when the other team members blame them for freeloading, um, you know, you should have been at work uh, helping us get this product out the door on time instead of sunning yourself down the beach. Um, that team member being blamed wants to be accepted by the other team members. So blaming them will allow that other team member to feel guilty and modify their behaviour so then it becomes in line with the other team members um, expectations. So praise and blame has an important part to play in modifying other people's behaviour. Same with um, praise. I mean it's interesting, hard determinists when they say we shouldn't be blaming people because they couldn't help what they did, they very rarely talk about praise because if we're not going to blame people then ipso facto we also shouldn't be praising people. And I talk about when my daughter uh, did really well in her exam, if we follow these hard determinist reasoning, then I should be saying to my daughter, hey, um, you have no right to feel proud. Don't expect anything from me uh, because your doing well on that exam was not down to you. It was down to the impersonal forces in the universe bringing that about. So how would that make my daughter or your daughter or son feel? So this is the second aspect of praise and blame. Now I said I had a twofold approach. So one part is as a modifier of people's actions. The other part is acting in a really personal way with other people saying it's developing those bonds, those close bonds of humanity with another human being. It could be another team member. In this case, I was talking about my daughter. When I praise my daughter, people like to be praised. And when people are praised, it increases uh, the likability of the person doing the praise. So praise is the glue one of the glues that brings people together and helps people form those really important relationship bonds. So that's the other fundamental importance of praise and blame. Bringing people together, bringing out those real human relationships with your daughter or your teammate that you want to develop. And I think the two, it's not either or, I think these two aspects of praise and blame work, work well together to form a fully rounded view of why it's right to praise and blame people. So the well-known uh, British moral philosopher Jonathan Glover talks about the example of the wife who finds out that his, her husband was cheating on him and she's a card-carrying hard determinist and she, re she regrets that her husband cheated on him but like a, a good hard determinist, she says, even though I didn't want you to do what you did, I can't blame you because you were just buffeted around by the impersonal forces of the universe. You cheating on me was just the universe unfolding as it had to do. Now, this is really important because Jonathan Glover makes the point 
that this is really devaluing not only the relationship, but devaluing the humanity of the husband. Because here, the hard determinist wife is treating her husband not as a loving partner with mutual responsibilities, but literally as a robot going about their daily life and having no choice but just being buffeted around by the forces of the universe, treating her husband as a robot with no agency. So think about it. If you're a husband or you're a wife or a partner and your partner saw you not as someone engaged in a mutually beneficial, mutually respectful, loving relationship, but just someone who's literally a robot, how would you feel? So this is Jonathan Glover's main point. Thinking in these hard deterministic terms where people have no agency, people can't be praised or blamed, it's literally de denying our humanity. What advice would you give to individuals struggling with the concept of free will in their personal lives? Um, so some way somebody could struggle is uh, thinking fatalistically, thinking that whatever I do, the universe is going to unfold, uh, unfold in its own way. So there's no point me trying to get a better job with more pay. There's no point um, me going to university to get a better education because the universe will just do what it's going to do. So this sounds depressing because it's denying the person of agency, the ability to change the way their life unfolds. Now, this brings a really important distinction between determinism and fatalism. So you can be a determinist and not a fatalist. So I'm suggesting this person is thinking in a fatalistic way that doesn't matter what I do, my life is going to turn out the way it's going to turn out. No, even if determinism is true, you are an agent of your own choices. You are that part of the universe bounded by your body and brain that has, is having an impact on the world. So when you apply for a better job, you doing that, this bundle, you know, you can call yourself a wet robot, this bundle of neurons is having an impact on the world, on your future life, depending on what this bundle of neurons is actually going to do. So even though you're a deterministic being, the choices that this bundle of neurons make does make a real difference to way, the way the, li the life of this bundle of neurons is going to experience into the future. So you've been, you've read Sam Harris's book, Free Will, it's a short book, but you do have some bones of contention with that piece of writing. Yeah, I think two things. One is he assumes mostly that if determinism, therefore no free will. And he has a couple of passages where he tries to combat the compatibilist argument, the compatibilist analysis that determinism is compatible with free will, but he does it in such a dismissive and very quick way. He doesn't really engage with the modern compatibilist analyses. Um, so largely he's assuming determinism, therefore no free will. That's the first bone I've got to pick. The second one is halfway, it's interesting, halfway through the book, he changes tact very radically. So in the early chapters, He's really arguing very strongly, literally, that we don't have agency, that we don't have, we don't make genuine choices because everything you do, you do is determined by your genes and your upbringing and you don't have control over that. So if you don't have control over that, you don't have control of your life. No agency, no genuine choice. Driving that home very hard in the first half of the book. The second half is where he does a complete U-turn and because he's a, um, 
uh, using a technical term, a meta-ethical utilitarian. He's a, he's a moral philosopher that argues there is genuine right and wrong. We do make good and bad decisions. So he wants to rescue that there is morality, that we can make right and wrong choices. He wants to rescue that. But hey, guess what? If we're moral agents, we have to make genuine choices. We have to be able to genuinely choose what we choose. So this is where he does a complete U-turn and all of a sudden starts arguing that, hey, yeah, some of the choices that we make, because if they come from the reasoning cognitive parts of our brain where we're these higher order cognitive processes, these are the choices that really matter and where we do have real choices, uh, hence morality is real, but this is where the real um, s split in Sam Harris's brain and reasoning is, because he's done a complete U-turn, whereas before he says, we don't make real choices, we have no agency, we have no control, but to rescue the notion of morality, he then has to argue, well, there are some things we do, some choices we do make that are real choices and they do, uh, uh, and we need that because we, morality is real. All right, given the fact that you haven't actually read Sapolsky's book, but you've read a few reviews and um, you've read something on his views on quantum indeterminacy, what's your hatchet job on his view on free will and compatibilism and indeterminacy and determinacy? Um, so with Robert Sapolsky's book, Determinism, it's a much more substantial book and I think much, it will be much better argued than Sam Harris's 45 pages of text. Um, Sapolsky's book goes to 500 pages, so there's a lot of meat in there. And I think Sapolsky knows a lot more about biology and neuroscience than Sam Harris. But uh, my impressions of the book so far are that early on in the book, he's making the same mistake as, um, as Sam Harris. He's saying early on in the book that there's all these compatibilists and I'm going to deal with them, but he doesn't give them their dues early on in the book. The way he, early on in the book, he's assuming that if all of our actions are determined, then, hey, you know, it's obvious there is no free will. So he's already flippantly disregarding compatibilism. And I'd say he's priming people He's priming readers early on in his book. He's making it seem natural that if determinism is true, then of course we can't have free will. He's, so he's priming readers um, early on. Um, so I'm waiting to see how he um, deals with the compatibilists and I haven't got to that, to that yet, so I, I can't argue about that. I have had read reviews where he doesn't deal with the compatibilists um, Give, he doesn't really engage with the compatibilists, so I'll, I'll have to wait and see whether he does or whether he's as equally dismissive. I'm, I'm thinking he won't be as equally dismissive as Harris is in his very short text. Okay, yeah. Do you want to discuss the relationship between moral responsibility and determinism? Yeah, so the indeterminists um, like the libertarians argue that if there isn't some causal slackness in our decisions, that if, if everything, all of our actions are completely determined, then it robs us of moral responsibility. And I'm thinking, well, actually, it's the other way. If there's causal slackness in whether I'm going to rob a bank or not, if, it's, if whether I rob a bank or not is down to whether... Um, a pi meson was ejected by a neuron um, by some act of chance, then how is that down to me? So it seems that indeterminacy, the slackness in indeterminacy is actually robbing us of our moral responsibility because the way I act is then not down to my character. It's down to things outside of my established character and my higher order desires. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, my way of thinking is that 
moral responsibility actually requires that we act deterministically. So I give the example in my essay of Mary who makes a loan to a criminal and she doesn't know that Jack is a criminal. And whether we blame Mary for loaning to the criminal depends on whether we think that if Mary knew that Jack was a criminal, would she have loaned the money to Jack? And if we say, ah, if Mary loaned the money to uh, Jack and she knew, she knew he was a criminal, we would blame Mary. Whereas if we say that if Mary knew that Jack was a criminal and because of that she didn't loan the money, we would applaud her. Great, you knew it was wrong to loan money to criminals. Okay, but how can we do that if Mary's decision to loan uh, the money to Jack was undetermined at the time she made the choice? Because our evaluation of Mary depends on the counterfactual. If Mary had known that Jack was a criminal, she would not have loaned the money. How can we say that if indeterminism is true? It's still an open question on indeterminism because it's down to some kind of chance or quantum indeterminacy. We can't answer the question if Mary had known that John, uh, Jack was a criminal, she would not have loaned the money. There's no right or wrong, there's no yes or no right or wrong answer to that. It's undetermined. Therefore, we cannot praise or blame Mary on the basis of knowing the answer to that counterfactual. So moral responsibility, to my mind, and praise and blame goes out the window if there's this causal slackness in our decision making. So I think our praise and blame really presupposes that human beings act in law-like ways. They act in ways that are a function of their belief, desires and values, that there's no causal slackness there. They act in concert with their behaviour and their higher order desires. Can't be the case that they sometimes act out, outside of their character because of this slackness. Yeah, I think the key message I'd like to bring across, which is what I try to bring across when I talk to um, groups of people, audiences, is that just think through that if determinism is true, don't automatically assume that we are robbed of agency, we are robbed of the capacity of free will, the, uh, we are robbed of the rightness of praise and blame, there's an argument that's got to be done to argue from determinism, therefore no free will, therefore no moral responsibility, therefore no agency. Don't just assume it. And I reinforce that 60% of philosophers who have considered this issue come to the conclusion that determinism is completely consistent with free will and moral responsibility and agency. So please consider the arguments for thinking that determinism is completely compatible with uh, free will and agency and moral res responsibility. And please try not to go to the knee-jerk reaction of autumn. See, I find hard determinists when I talk to them automatically slipping into the old modes of thinking and they, before I finish the talk, they say, yeah, but Les, if our actions are determined, then it can't be this or can't be that. And I always say, please listen to the whole argument. I have, in my paper, I have seven separate arguments arguing for the compatibility between determinism and free will. And please listen to all of the arguments and hear it through to the end and think through the reasoning that I'm putting forward. So that's what I ask of people.